One of the things that I, I noticed kind of going through your, your backlog in preparation for this is that there's an incredible you know, diversity to what you cover. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that you mentioned that phrase like a beat, you know, because there's a certain perspective, which like, even though, you know, Substack is kind of free from the constraints of like a normal publishing model, it's like we, we, people still do it anyway, you know? Yeah. And, and so you have people who can essentially write whatever they want. And it's like, okay, man, like, this is the third, third article on, on climate change this week. Like, you know, you, you can do other stuff if you want to, right? No, one, no one's got a gun to your head. And yeah. So, yeah. It, yeah. I feel like there's, um, so because of the way Substack's set up, uh, the, you can use it in a different way from previous blogging platforms. So, you know, there used to be kind of an ethos of if you're not putting out content like every single day and ideally like three or four times per day, like all these little micro posts to get people to keep coming back to your website, they'll forget you exist and then your traffic drops off and you know building it back up again is very difficult. So there's just this um, incentive to like, just be constantly churning out content uh, regardless of its quality. And then, you know, you kind of repeat yourself a lot and maybe it gets kind of boring. Um, but with, because of the subscription model in Substack, your readers are notified immediately when you pub publish something. So uh, you can go a week, two weeks, a month, I went three months at one point, uh, about a year ago, uh, didn't publish anything because I just, eh, it was a rough time in my life. Um, and, you know, then I put up the next article and like, boom, like, you know, thousands of people like, you know, coming and reading it and uh, um, just like, you know, uh, I just left the room and come back kind of thing. So you don't have, the point is you don't have to be putting out the same content all the time. And um yeah the beat thing yeah that seems to come from like traditional publishing as well you're supposed to like develop like a specialty like find like a niche and then dominate like that like sort of like sub niche and like that that can be a, a valid strategy i've definitely seen that work for people for me I, I just think it gets boring after a while and i know with like my own reading habits um you know i'll subscribe to someone because you know i'm interested in what they're writing about at the time and then maybe after like a couple of months and say, like, ah, it's the same thing all the time because they're just repeating themselves. And then I stop, I just kind of tune them out. You know, I don't actually go and read them. Whereas writers that I know are a little bit more diverse, when they publish, it's like, oh, like, you know, what have they, what have they written about this time? And especially if they haven't published in a while, because that often tends to mean that they've polished up a little bit more, they put a little bit more thought into it. And it's definitely not going to be a waste of my time to read. Well, it's actually, I don't know, I, I think about this a lot, but it does sort of seem like we're in sort of a, you know, a renaissance on the, you know, the, should we just say the dissident right? You know, whatever you want to say is modern. It, and I was talking to, you know, Tom, and his point was basically like, he's been in this for a long time. And he remembers mm -hmm. actually photocopied newsletters, right? And you'd be, you know, you'd be the, the biggest guy in the world if you had a newsletter with a you know with a hundred people on it right and now right, it's like, right. now it's like there's any number of those hey john just just one thing can you uh mute in between uh oh sure yeah yeah, yeah sorry i'm just getting a little bit of feedback and i know if i don't address it now i'll get like a hundred comments about it uh, anyway sorry but you know there is something to which like platforms like substack have enabled this incredible explosion and i sort of missed the first kind of like renaissance of blogging you know i come from you know kind of more nrx background but it's all secondhand you know i was going through mold bug reading you know spandrel and stuff like that in in 2018 2019 you know well after that scene was kind of gone and dead and, and so i'm curious right as someone who's you know been kind of tied to that platform like what do you see as the you know advantage of substack other than just as like a place to to kind of post a blog i know you've mentioned some of it that it has that ability to stick but do you think that it has kind of a different culture around it? Yeah. So um, there's a few advantages that it has over previous platforms. One is the network effect potential, which is already being capitalized on, uh, which and that manifests in a few ways. So um, if you go to the comments section under any Substack blog, uh, you'll note that um, commenters who also have a substack the name of their substack is like written next to their their handle 
uh, on their comment. And you can click on that and then like, you know, see, you know, what they've written on their own blog. So, uh, you know, commenters can, this is how I built mine at the beginning. Cause I noticed that feature and I was like, oh, if I just comment on high traffic blogs and not only high traffic blogs, and I make sure that it's like cogent, interesting, um, you know, not just like, Hey, everyone come check out my blog too. But like, you know, like not even promoting my blog, just kind of like, you know, making like a good comment, engaging in good faith, then, you know, maybe a few readers will be reading the comments and they'll see that and be like, Oh, that's a good comment and click through. Maybe I pick up a subscriber and that ends up working. And I know it's worked for a lot of, uh, a lot of my readers as well, who started their own, their own blogs and kind of promoted them in the same way. Um, there's the recommendation feature where, uh, a writer who, uh, if you if you like another writer, their material, you can recommend directly to your readers that they should subscribe to that person too. Uh, and that's when they implemented that feature. I actually lucked out because I started mine like a, a week before they rolled that feature out. And um, people's subscription numbers just like, you know, like the, the subscription rate doubled more or less overnight when they had that. Um, and we can... Combine that with the kind of, the, you know, the, the large ecosystem they've been able to attract. Uh, the network effects really start to build up. And of course, you know, the other advantage for writers um, is the payment model. You can put things behind paywalls if you want. I almost never do. Uh, I kind of treat my, 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 I've got a paid option, but it's kind of like a tip. Like if you really like my stuff, yeah, you can give me money. I won't say no. But I also really like engagement and, you know, um, letting people, letting anyone who wants read what I write. Uh, but that payment feature means that writers can actually make a little bit of money. You can turn into a side gig rather than just a hobby. And actually some have managed to make it their full-time job because they're pulling in so many subscribers that they're able to support themselves fairly comfortably. Uh, I know one guy who's paying his mortgage using his Substack. Um, so that's, that's really a, a total, that's a sea change for writers because before that, the only way to really make money on your blog was like advertising. And then you, you know, you run into problems with like Google being like, oh, we don't like your politics. So, you know, we're going to like delist you like all the, all the same things that, you know, they do on YouTube, for example, but that's not like, that's not an issue on Substack at all. Um, the, uh, the Substack team so far have been, um, extremely solid on the free speech issue like you know don't break the law but otherwise like say whatever you want well and that's especially interesting when it comes to uh, when it comes to publishing right you know I, i've talked to people like tr hudson and and you know the guy adam who came on and each of them mentioned the fact that if you're a you know if you're someone who has you know, a creative idea you want to get out there that effectively traditional publishing is is closed to you you know i remember very clearly a couple of years ago this article came out you know where this this woman was basically saying and it was it was largely unrelated to the kind of core of the article but essentially she was a works a large publishing company and basically said like oh yeah if we we look at the name you know and if the name fits certain categories you can kind of figure out which we just throw it in the trash straight out and you know there is a part of writing, especially creative writing that requires, you know, iteration and feedback, right? But at the same time, like if you just never get oxygen at all, you know, if you're just sending, you know, if you're sending articles or you're sending, you know, manuscripts out and they're just being thrown away, like what good does that do you? And so there's any number of people I've talked to, you know, probably half a dozen who've started publishing either directly, you know, off Amazon or doing kind of a, like a serializing their own work. And that's something that's very interesting to me because obviously, you know, like we can complain as much as you know we want to go blue in the face about you know, like no new art is being produced. But there's a certain perspective where it's like, okay, well, if you're not, you know, if you're not trying, you know, your criticism is sort of mute. Or, and so, at least to me, like I, I think that that's a very interesting development to watch. You know, there's a very interesting community of creative writers on Substack. Yeah, the um, it's actually been very strange to me with uh, the creative writing aspect on Substack, like the actual the fiction writing. And one of the reasons that I actually haven't really put a lot of that up myself is that I've I've noticed that it gets a lot less engagement, so I'm kind of like less motivated to do that. But not just on my own blog, 
but um, on other blogs as well, like the creative uh, people are you know, put, posting like fiction or poetry, don't get nearly the amount of uh, attention that you know people um, bloviating about politics will tend to get. Uh, and that's that's kind of too bad. And so, I mean, several months ago, for a while, I had a feature where I was trying to um, you know promote people's work every week, so I'd have a kind of roundup that I, I compiled from sort of as many sub stacks as I could. And I'd write like uh, a little sort of like praise of, of the piece and like link to it and kind of like hand out awards to like the things that I thought were the best and, you know, try to like direct traffic to them. And like, it was a lot of work to do that. So I eventually kind of stopped doing it, but I had like a special section for fiction. So it was really important to me to try and get a, a little bit more, um, a little bit more attention to them because I think that is really important. Uh, precisely because, as you said, in like the sort of like you know big publishing houses, like they're so ideologically locked down right now that you just can't break in if you're a white guy or you have the wrong politics or you know especially both. And the wrong politics are so so narrowly defined, or I guess the wrong politics are so broadly defined. The correct politics are so narrowly defined. Um, so you mentioned like the Amazon aspect, uh, and actually from what I've been reading, um, Kindle Unlimited has kind of killed that for a lot of independent writers, uh, just because of the way it's set up. So before they rolled that feature out, you could put up your Kindle, you know, get like the five dollars for the download, and great, great, you got five dollars in your pocket. Um, then they rolled out Kindle Unlimited, and you know the the users pay whatever it is, like $10 a month. And then Amazon sees how many pages of each of the, because when you have it, you can just download as many Kindles as you want from the participating publishers. Um, and Amazon will track how many pages you read of any given. So if you only read like a few pages of an ebook you downloaded, um, then the author of that ebook gets um, the $10 a month divided by the number of pages of his book that you read divided by the number of total pages he read that month kind of thing uh so that that is just dramatically slashed the profits that writers are able to make on that and what they're doing is actually switching to something a little bit more like substack where uh like a neo patronage model um you know through like patreon or kickstarter or things like that where you know you build up a, a relationship with a small but enthusiastic uh fan base and you know they support you uh as best as they're able in order to continue making content that they enjoy um and we mentioned uh, the blood satellite podcast uh in the, the sort of uh pre-game and um that's kind of their philosophy too, I think. Like they, they've got like a fairly tight knit fan base, but they're incredibly enthusiastic about the show. And as a result of that, they're able to kind of uh, not quite support themselves from it, but it's self-sustaining, you know? Um, and I think that could actually be at least the foreseeable future of creative endeavors is like, you know, very few giant stars making millions of dollars a year from uh, their voice or their writing or what have you, but a much larger number of people making a reasonable middle class income um, with much smaller, more enthusiastic fan communities. When you think about that, that's kind of it's Lindy in a way, right? That the idea of you know entertainment as this centralized product is is relatively confined to the 20th century. You know, when you think of like, well, like okay, what was a musician? You know, well, to be a you know a, a musician who sustained themselves, you know, for the vast majority of history was relatively that's a simple thing. You know, well, someone needed that in your area, that's your job, you know, versus this era of, you know, record labels where it was, you know, very, very dependent on, you know, breaking into that, you know, top 40 being a, a star. And you start, you've already seen in music, you know, the decay of that because of streaming services, that there are more people into, you know, more different things. But I could definitely see that on the more, I don't know what you'd call us or the sphere infotainment. I don't know, whatever, that, that sphere as well. 